Welcome, dear friends, to the service for Sunday, the 9th of June, the third Sunday after Pentecost. And I pray that we will all be blessed as we share in this time together. Looking at the parish, the birthdays on the 11th of June, Jessica Prim, on the 16th of June, Rowena Spratt and Tisha Matthews. We wish you all a very happy birthday and pray that the year ahead will be truly blessed. Anniversaries on the 12th of June, Phil and Judy Brayshaw celebrate their wedding anniversary. Congratulations and we do pray that there would be many more to come. Father, thank you that you're a God of amazing grace and you're a God of an amazing sacrifice when you sent your Son whose blood has cleansed us from all sin. All hail the Lamb and throned on high His praise shall Lord be with you. Praise the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, 
all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let us confess our sins, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with our neighbour. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon our sins and set us free from them, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for the Third Sunday after Pentecost. Let us pray. Our Father, from whom every family on earth takes its name, help us to do your will, that as sisters and brothers of Christ, we may love and serve you and one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from the first book of Samuel, chapter 8, verses 4 to 11 and 16 to 20. The people ask for a king. Then all the leaders of Israel met together went to Samuel in Ramah and said to him, Look, you are getting old and your sons don't follow your example. So then, appoint a king to rule over us, so that we will have a king as other countries have. Samuel was displeased with their request for a king, so he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said, Listen to everything the people say to you. You are not the one they have rejected. I am the one they have rejected as their king. Ever since I brought them out of Egypt, they have turned away from me and worshipped other gods. And now they are doing to you what they have always done to me. So then, listen to them, but give them strict warnings and explain how their kings will treat them. Samuel told the people who were asking him for a king everything that the Lord had said to him. This is how your king will treat you, Samuel explained. He will make soldiers of your sons. Some of them will serve in his war chariots, others in his cavalry, and others will run before his chariots. He will take your servants and your best cattle and donkeys and make them work for him. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that time comes, you will complain bitterly because of your king, whom you yourselves chose, but the Lord will not listen to your complaints. The people paid no attention to Samuel and said, 
No, we want a king, so that we will be like other nations, with our own king to rule us and to lead us out to war and to fight our battles. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 138 I will give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Even before the gods will I sing your praises. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name because of your faithfulness and your loving kindness, for you have made your name and your word supreme over all things. At a time when I called to you, you gave me answer and put new strength within my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, that the glory of the Lord is great. For though the Lord is exalted, he looks upon the lowly, but he humbles the proud from afar. Though I walk in the midst of danger, yet will you preserve my life. You will stretch out your hand against the fury of my enemies, and your right hand shall save me. The Lord will complete his purpose for me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your own hands. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading comes from Corinthians 2, chapter 4, verse 13, to chapter 5, verse 1. The scripture says, I spoke because I believed. In the same spirit of faith, we also speak because we believe. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus to life, will also raise up, us up with Jesus and take us together with you into his presence. All this is for your sake, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, they will offer to the glory of God more prayers of thanksgiving. For this reason we never become discouraged. Even though our physical being is gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. And this small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us tremendous and eternal glory, much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. For we know that when this tent we live in, our body here on earth is torn down, God will have a house in heaven for us to live in, a home he himself has made, which will last forever. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 3, beginning to read at the 20th verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. 
I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting round him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Over the next few Sundays, the first readings in our service will be stories from the life of David, the outstanding king of ancient Israel. This is quite significant because the start of the monarchy meant an enormous change in the way that Israel was governed and organized. You see, right from the beginning, God's people have been shaped and sustained through covenants. Of course, there have always been leaders mediating this covenant. People like Moses and Joshua feature prominently on that list. But even under their leadership, all was not well for the people of God. The Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says the following regarding the monarchy. This change brings huge challenges in order to relate royal ideology and power to the claims of covenantal faith and covenantal eth ethics. The institution of monarchy does not easily accommodate itself to covenantal power arrangements. These chapters in 1 Samuel are an interpretive reflection on this difficult and crucial relation between new forms of social relations and an old, honored, well-established theological tradition. As we've been following the lectionary, our last encounter with Samuel happened when he was a boy in the temple. Now he is as old as Eli was then, and in a similar predicament. You see, Eli's sons defiled worship practice in the temple, and now Samuel's sons have taken bribes and undermined the justice of Israel. This is an important context for what is coming next. Because although the power plays are moving into the political realm, it is already well established that when granted positions of power, God's people rarely live up to them. In fact, the question of this chapter is how to order public power and how to guard public well-being in a community where the leadership tends to pervert that power and well-being. Isn't this still the challenge for God's church today in society? So today's reading from 1 Samuel serves as a preface for the series of David's stories that we're going to be looking at. It explains how the monarchy originates in a crisis around Samuel and his sons. And this morning Samuel gives a warning to the people of Israel. This reading, I think, also poses a very challenging question to us. Where do we turn for leadership in life? As I said, the start of the monarchy meant an enormous change in the way that Israel was governed and organized. And the whole reason for this request for a king was driven by the fact that Samuel, who was God's anointed leader, was getting old and there needed to be a successor. At this time in the history of God's people, the Philistines posed a serious threat and they were well equipped and also very well organized. The Israelites had the advantage of a bigger population, but they were not united. The various Israelite tribes acted independently to a large extent, and none of them had any form of permanent army. So they needed something, some means of uniting the tribes and building up an army. In the ancient world, kingship was the only possible structure for achieving this goal. So from a purely historical perspective, 
this urgent request for a king was a natural one. However, if we look at the situation from the perspective of the biblical author and theologically, we see that it is very different. From this perspective, Israel already had a king, none other than Yahweh himself. Human kings might be weak or incompetent, but how could a divine king fail to lead his people to peace and prosperity? God had proved many times in the past that he could give his people victory, and in the person of Samuel, God had already provided them with all the human leadership that was necessary. Samuel is not a king, but he has served many years as the leader of the nation. He was promised by his parents to serve God and had grown up and worked under Eli in the temple. Samuel succeeded Eli and was a faithful servant of God who obediently served God during his time of service. Hoping to continue in the service of God, Samuel arranges for his sons Joel and Abijah to succeed him, but the people reject them because the sons have proved themselves unworthy. Joel and Abijah did not follow their father's example, and we read in chapter 8 verse 3, But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. And so we see the elders of Israel visit Samuel in his hometown, and they ask him to appoint a king as his successor. They want to have a king rule over them like the other nations do. This request, of course, displeases Samuel and he feels rejected by the people, so he prays to the Lord about it. But the Lord tells Samuel to let the people have what they want. This request for a king, the Lord says, was not a rejection of Samuel, but a rejection of the Lord himself as their king. If you think about it, this is not something new. The people have repeatedly rejected the Lord since he delivered them from Egypt. They keep forsaking him by serving other gods instead. This demand for a human king is nothing new. The Lord also tells Samuel to explain to the people the ways of a king so that they will know the trouble they are getting themselves into. Samuel describes to the people eloquently and in detail how their king will dominate them, but they reject this warning. No, the people insist, we are determined to have a king over us so that we may be like other nations. The people tell Samuel they want to be like other nations. They do not want to stand out as God's people. They want to be normal, as it were. This is their great temptation as a people. Wanting to be normal can also be a personal temptation. Often it is our temptation not to stand out, but to be like everybody else. Sometimes the desire to be normal is acceptable or even commendable. For example, when we walk outside in a rainstorm, it's normal to have an umbrella. In this society, it's normal to brush your teeth. But sometimes the normal can be contrary to the will of God. What's popular can be unjust. Just think about the bully on the school playground with a whole lot of children laughing at the way he's teasing someone weaker than himself. Do you join with the majority in the laughing? Sometimes the perceived normal can be simply an illusion. We must be very careful when we wish to be like everybody else. The normal can become a slippery evasive standard. It can mean entrusting ourselves to what does not deserve our trust. The people tell Samuel that they want to be like other nations. But what convinces them that the other nations are right? Samuel seems to understand the truth and, as it turns out, the people will be oppressed by the monarchy that they are demanding. In this morning's Gospel reading, Jesus is the one who knows the truth, that the world is in grave danger. The world is being controlled by sin and by evil. And Jesus knows that these forces are more than the world can handle, more than we can handle. He is the on only one who can save the world from them. But almost nobody believes him. His family thinks that he's gone out of his mind. They've come to restrain him. 
The religious leaders think that he is working with the devil. They think that he has an unclean spirit. But the truth is almost exactly the opposite. It is the world that has gone out of its mind. The world, you might say, has an unclean spirit and is being ruled by evil. And Jesus has come to save the world. He's come to free the world from its captivity to sin, death and the devil. And he's come to bring the world to its senses. And if you think about it, this is still Jesus' mission today. The same message is still the one that we need to hear, that the world is in grave danger. It has gone out of its mind and it is being ruled by powers that are trying to destroy it. And Jesus is the only one who can save it, who can save us. There's another truth that is critical for us to remember today from the Gospel reading. Jesus tells us in this reading that he has come to tie up the strong man, to bind Satan. And that is exactly what he has done. And that, for us, is really good news. It's a rather strange way of putting it, of course, but that is what Jesus says. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder the property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. It makes sense when you think of the strong man as Satan. That is who Jesus has come to tie up. And through the cross and resurrection, he did exactly that. Martin Luther, in writing about this passage, says the following. Why should you fear? Why should you be afraid? Do you not know that the prince of this world has been judged? He is no lord, no prince anymore. You have a different, a stronger lord, Christ, who has overcome and bound him. Therefore, let the prince and god of this world look sour, bare his teeth, make a great noise, threaten, and act in an unmannerly way. He can do no more than a bad dog on a chain, which may bark, run here and there, and tear at the chain. But because it is tied, and you avoid it, it cannot bite you. You see, the devil can bare his teeth, make a great noise, but he can't break free of this chain. He can't bite us, not anymore. So we need not be afraid of him. There is still evil in our world, obviously, but we can fight it without fear because we believe the good news that Jesus has proclaimed to us, that the strong man is tied up, that Satan is defeated, bearing his teeth, barking, but helpless to do anything more. So I come back to the question I asked earlier, where do we turn for leadership in life? We don't need to search for a king to lead us like the Israelites did, because we have a saviour who is already victorious through what was achieved on the cross. So now we can get to work being the church in the world. And what does that mean? Well, we can fight evil in this world. We can feed the hungry, we can care for the sick, we can proclaim the good news of Jesus to everyone. We can strive for justice and peace throughout the earth. We can do everything that Jesus asks us to do, because he has already done the hard work. And finally, I think we can rejoice in the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Amen. This morning we will use a form C of the prayers in the Anglican prayer book found on page 113. Let us pray. Father, we are your children. Your Spirit lives in us, and we are in your Spirit. Hear us, for it is your Spirit who speaks through us as we pray. Lord, hear us. Father, you created the heavens and the earth. 
Bless the produce of our land and the works of our hands. Lord, hear us. Father, you created us in your own image. Teach us to honor you in all your children. Lord, hear us. Father, in your steadfast love, you provide for your creation. Grant good rains for our crops. Lord, hear us. Father, you inspired the prophets of old. Grant that your church may faithfully proclaim your truth to the world. Lord, hear us. Father, you sent your Son into the world. Reveal him to others through his life in us. Lord, hear us. Lord Jesus, you sent your apostles to make disciples of all nations. Bless the bishops of this province, especially Daniel, our bishop, together with Tabo, our metropolitan, and all other ministers of your church. Christ, hear us. Lord Jesus, for your sake, men and women forsook all and followed you. Call many to serve you in religious communities and in the ordained ministry of your church. Christ, hear us. Lord Jesus, you called your disciples to take up the cross, deepen in each of us a sense of vocation. Christ, hear us. You prayed for your church to be one. Unite all Christians that the world may believe. Christ, hear us. You forgave the thief on the cross. Bring us all to penitence and reconciliation. Christ, hear us. You broke down the walls that divide us. Bring the people of this world to live in peace and concord. Christ, hear us. You taught us, through Paul, your apostle, to pray for kings and rulers. Bless and guide all who are in authority. Christ, hear us. You were rich, yet for our sake you became poor. Move those who have wealth to share generously with those who are poor. Christ, hear us. You sat among the learned, listening and asking them questions. Inspire all who teach and all who learn. Christ, hear us. You cured by your healing touch and word. Heal the sick and bless those who minister to them. Christ, hear us. You were unjustly condemned by Pontius Pilate. Strengthen our brothers and sisters who are suffering injustice and persecution. Christ, hear us. You lived as an exile in Egypt. Protect and comfort all refugees. Christ, hear us. You knew the love and care of an earthly home. Be with migrant workers and protect their families. Christ, hear us. You open and none can shut. Open the gates of your kingdom to those who have died without hearing your gospel. Christ, hear us. You have been glorified in the lives of innumerable saints. Give us strength through their prayers to follow in their footsteps. Christ, hear us. Father, we know that you are good and that you hear those who call upon you. Give to us and to all people what is best for us, that we may glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. We come now to the celebration of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary, 
and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfilment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you, and so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of the evil one and banish the darkness of sin and death. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Who in the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we bring before you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honour are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, give us your peace. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, 
that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Draw near and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ broken for us. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for us. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious, his mercy endures forever. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for keeping us by your grace in the body of your Son, the company of all faithful people. Help us to persevere as living members of that holy fellowship, and to grow in love and obedience according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God bless Africa, protect our children, transform our leaders, heal our communities, restore our dignity, and give us peace for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, remain with us now and always. Amen. So dear friends, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.